Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for, for staying. The purpose of this second part of the afternoon is, as director of the forum, we're actually going to launch the beginning of our consultation process on professional development for higher education in Ireland. Just so that you actually know where it actually fits in, is that this is the, the for, a lot of people are familiar with our wheel and our work plan, but professional development is one of the key elements of the work plan for the forum. And our plan is that um, over the coming, the next three months, we'll consult with the sector. Over the summer, we'll be pulling together all of the submissions. In September, we'll put out a second document for, for comment and consultation. And our view, our, our ambition is to have a framework that we can pilot uh, at the beginning of uh, 2016, in January 2016. And what I'm going to do uh, just for the next few minutes is to actually explain the journey that produced this document. And because, you know, the forum has shorter versions of everything, we actually have a short summary as well that you can read uh, uh, if, if you want. So, one of the things when we started out in this is that there was no visibility about what was actually available in higher education, what qualifications were available, what, there was no collection of the credited and non-accredited PD, there was no one place you can go, and Lynn had done some work a, a number of years ago, and, but it, it actually, we needed something up to date. So we said, well, what was actually happening in Ireland, and what did we actually, what, what was available now? So what we actually did first, was we looked at accredited professional development. And we looked and we worked with the institutions to identify what kinds of courses, what kinds of provision, accredited provision, was available for academic staff in higher education. And we got lots of numbers. Those of you that know me will know I like numbers. So we found that there was 62 courses in all that had been offered in 2013. 450 people graduated from 58 of those courses. 10 of the courses were delivered entirely online. The rest of the courses, there was an even split between fully face-to-face -face and what was termed blended. 45 of the courses were certificate courses, normally uh, uh, somewhere between five and 30 credits. 14 of the courses were master's courses from 90 to 120 credits. And there was nine diploma programs. All but one course was actually at level nine. The information and, and the pulling together of all of this data and what we learnt about it will be available shortly as part of the consultation process on the, the forum website. What we did then was we said, well, what are they teaching? So we went and looked at the learning outcomes and we looked at the program outcomes. And we did a qualitative analysis to see what was going on. What were the things that people felt should be included in a teaching and learning qualification for staff? And John, you'll be very glad to hear reflective practice, development of research skills, digital pedagogy, teaching methods and approaches. And if I look, if I take all of the courses about 40% of courses are, are about these teaching, general teaching methods and approaches. About 25% of them are, are the, it is about reflective practice. Um, about 17% of it, or 18% of it is about developing research skills. And digital pedagogy was the other 17%. So it gave us a flavor of what was already on offer. But it didn't actually give us any sense about what the non-accredited CPD looked like. And we know, we know from, from all the institutions that there's a huge amount of non-accredited PD on offer. Um, we did a survey, uh, uh, 20 questions for technology-enhanced learning. We had nearly 800 responses um, from staff uh, across the sector. And actually, the, the highlights of that are in a forum insight in your pack. And what you'll actually see, and it echoes almost exactly what you said. There's, it was, they talked sometimes about uh, not having availability of CPD, or, oh yes, there was lots of CPD there, but we didn't have time to go for it. They talked about once-off opportunities. 
just we we actually went to it but by that was all right it was nice to know but by the time i actually got back to using it i had forgotten what i had actually learned and i had to start all over again so it echoed a lot of what you were saying this morning john so what we've done now and we'll have it available for june is we have um we have a, a research project that's actually going to try and capture a snapshot of the range and variety of non-accredited CPD offerings that are available within institutions. Because whatever framework that we actually develop, it's got to be able to take account of the non-accredited CPD and see, we have to find out how is it actually going to match in as well as the accredited CPD. The other thing that we, um, so, the other thing that we actually um, looked at very carefully was our professional bodies and disciplinary groups. And again, John, you mentioned it this morning. You have particular disciplines that are very educated, teaching and learning focused. And you have then groups like our, our engineers, Ireland, who have our professional bodies. And they already have frameworks that are in place that support the particular professions. So we've, we've spoken to them. We'll do more dialogue with them. But we're asking, how can we not reinvent the wheel and how can we find some synergy between the frameworks that are available for professionals and what we're actually, what's emerging and what's developing. So then we went around the world and uh, we said, if we go to a consultation and we sit down and we talk to people about it, they can only make a judgment on what they know. And for a lot of people, what they know would probably maybe be the, the UK system, maybe their professional body system. So we thought, well, let's look internationally and see what different um, approaches there are. And what we did was we actually interviewed via Skype or by, through webinar some of the key people in these countries that we'll talk about. And there's much more detailed case studies in the, the, the longer document that you'll see. So we went to Australia and we talked to, in Australia, and they took a, a sort of a, a two-prong approach. The, they had a, a promotion that was based on, on teaching, and then they had a, a national round table with vice chancellors. Um, and they were trying to answer the question, how can we as a sector more deeply professionalize teaching? And I think that came up this morning in the palette. They decided that a national framework wasn't for them. That wasn't where they actually wanted to be. They said disciplines are crucial. They said grassroots matter institutions matter, and they particularly put emphasis on new teachers. We need to build for the future. We went to Spain, and we got a kind of a different perspective. Um, in Spain, um, there's a national framework for professional development called Ducentia, and it's actually managed through their national quality body. And it evaluates teaching performance at a departmental level which is very interesting. Um, it's the same framework for all the disciplines, and you ha the departments have got to do a self-evaluation every five years against four key dimensions. There's the self-evaluatory part, there's an account of activities across teaching, so that's the engagement of staff in, in conferences, in, in professional development. There's the report from the dean of the faculty, and there's reports from the students. And their model is more one of sort of standard engagement rather than a transformation of practice. And it focuses on the quality of the programme at departmental level. But unfortunately, 98% of all of the departments think they're great. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. They all come out as being excellent. And as a result, they've actually um, lost a lot of their credibility. And that's something I think we need to keep in mind for our professional development framework. Um, one of the things I, I was interested in was that the way that they set up the framework and the way that they did it was actually influenced a lot by external stakeholders, including trade unions. And they, they had a very strong input in how that was set up. And that's something that we need to th think about as well. Um, in the Netherlands, um, in 2012, the Ministry of Education set up a performance agreement with institutions. And it's run through the quality assurance of the Netherlands universities. And the response was institutional initiatives, um, largely driven by their teaching and learning centres. And then the institutions report back to the quality authority. 
So the way it works in practice is, is interesting. So if you take Twente as, a, as an example, they have a particular pedagogical approach across their campus, which is to do with project-led learning. So any new teacher there must take TOM, which is a five-credit module on, um, on project-based learning, project-led learning. And that is, that is believed to be the, the starting point for their professional development. But the problem with it is that it's not flexible, is that there's a different model in the next university. So academic staff can't actually transfer what they've actually got readily to new situations as they, develop, as they go through throughout their career. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. One of the things that came across as well was that a lot of them don't look and don't acknowledge recognition of prior learning, although some do. Um, in the UK, and it's probably the one across our sector that most people are, are most aware of, um, it's managed by the Higher Education Academy who guards the professional standards, but it's owned by the sector. And it's, it's, it's uh, institutions volunteer to actually become part of it. Institutions can actually develop programs to become recognised as, as being equivalent in terms of the, the framework. Um, it recognises diversity. It's got multiple different pathways. Um, it actually works on a system of uh, a, quite a linear system from associate up to fellow and, and, and senior fellow. Um, the, uh, the administrative load around it is quite heavy. And the second part is, and what I actually like, is that it's actually monitored and regulated by colleagues as assessors. So there's very much an ownership of the sector that other colleagues are actually looking at applications, and I think that that's actually quite, quite useful. And when we put all of this um, stuff together, we actually uh, came up with a typology for curriculum professional development. And this is something I think that we need to think about. So for Ireland, do we want all our staff having to do <coughs> professional development? Is this something that we want? Or is it something that staff can opt in or opt out of? And there's arguments for both. Should it be led in terms of like a national agency? Or should it be led at the institutional in level? Should institutions take responsibility? Should it be membership-based? Should it be informal? Should it be once-off? Or should, should academics be required to actually be, remain in good standing in some way? And should it be a qualification? Or should you just have to demonstrate engagement with uh, professional development? And should we be creating sexual standards? Or should we be working towards sexual enhancement? And I would ask you, in terms of making submissions, to actually try and consider. What I'd like to do is to get a pathway through this to see what is the best pathway for Irish higher education. So when we put all the models together, we said, OK, what does this actually mean? And I stand here and say, I'm not sure that any of the models I'm going to show you are models that are going to be suitable for Ireland. But there may be aspects of it. And I remember very much when we started at the very beginning of this process, we said, we can't go in and just say, this is what we're doing, that are we going to look to the UK or look to Australia and say, we'll take this model. Whatever we do has got to be culturally appropriate. It's got to be applicable. It's got to be usable in the context that we're here in Ireland in higher education. So we need to give some thought to what model or what aspects of any of the models actually might suit. So this first model is a linear model. You go from novice to being expert. And it has some advantages. There's very clear progression lines. And there's a certain amount of kudos about being an expert. And it can incorporate accredited and non-accredited activities. But it's, it's on the negative side, it's like one pathway fits all. And there's no process to remain in good standing. And Linear suggests that there's a number of uh, skills required at each stage that demonstrates teaching excellence. And I'm a little bit worried about what happens when I become an expert. Do I stop then? But what happens if things change? So there's, there's some concerns about that one. The second model is where you have an 
everybody does the same foundation. And then people pick a range of specialisms around that particular foundation. And the single means that the single entry means that um, it might work for the sector. Um, you could have a, a kind of a level of teaching expertise that could actually be applied. Um, it incorporates the specialist options, which are good. You can incorporate accredited and non-accredited. That's no problem. Um, the pathways in terms of career development aren't that clear. And there's a lack of the hierarchy might cause problems for some senior staff. The need to do the foundation entry might cause problems for some senior staff. And you'd have to, you have to develop, as a result, you'll have to develop recognition of prior learning routes through the framework. The next model is a stage specialist. And this takes some of the best of model two, some of the best of model one. So what you have, you're combining the linear and the specialist module. And it allows for specialist options at, at certain um, uh, levels. But it also allows that when you get to the expert level to be able to take supplementary awards or, 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 or other modules. It, it, arrives, it gives that flexibility, I think, that's needed within a framework. Um, you'd have to, there has to be some way that remaining good standing is built into it. Um, and deciding which level that you'd actually need to be at before you can opt to the specialist options would also be, have to be thought about. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting model. The, third, the fourth model, it gives institutional freedom that you get nationally agreed standards. Um, it minimizes the need for central resources to manage it. Um, a concern may be that the, the, the standards, that you'd have a one set of standards for a diversity of roles that would need to be looked at. Um, it probably focuses a little more on institutional quality <coughs> rather than the individual CPD. And career pathways may not necessarily be evident. So there are four models. I'm sure there's lots more. But I do think that they give us some, some thought, something to think about, and to something to say, well, I like that or I don't like that. We have something to react to now. And in your submissions back to us, I really would encourage the reaction and saying, well, what kind of model for you personally, for your teams, for your staff, would, or, or, or what aspect of this would you like really incorporated into an Irish professional development framework? And I'll just say one word about the recognition of prior learning. We have, the forum currently has a, a research focus project on the recognition of prior learning that's going to look particularly at how uh, we can develop a framework that can actually sit alongside our professional development for our higher education. There isn't, there's a whole variety of methods uh, that are used currently for recognition of prior learning and a lot of work needs to be done. And one of the challenges that I see personally is that within our institutions for our students, we, we're, we're slow as a sector to recognize a lot of work-based learning to actually capture learning that isn't accredited. And yet we will now be the workplace person, we will be the people with our work-based learning looking to get accreditation perhaps on the professional framework. And I think that's something that we need to think about. And hopefully this, this research that we're doing and, um, will actually help to inform how that actually might happen within higher education. So when I think, and all of this is actually said to us, um, we have to make sure that the framework that we deliver has, we actually have highly regarded recognition. We do not want something that people don't value in the long term. This has to be something worthwhile. We have to be inclusive. There are so many different um, people who teach in higher education now that we have to provide options for. We have to be very clear about what it does and what it doesn't do. It has to be sustainable. If it requires a huge national resource, it's probably not going to work. So whatever model we come up with must be sustainable. It has to be flexible. It has to enable people that are already in the system to be able to map onto it. It has to enable our engineers or medics that have already got their own profession to be able to map onto it. 
People should be able to take what they've already done and find a way to position themselves on our framework. It has to be research informed and it has to be connected to practice. So, as of now, the consultation process is open. Um, you can actually access the consultation on our website, on the main page, and Colin is going to put it up right now. Um, about, uh, there's an interface here on the main page of our website under the tab that says Professional Development Consultation. The consultation is actually opened now until uh, the middle, the middle, the 10th of June. We've putting, we're putting the consultation documents that you have in your pack. They're actually up there. And what we'll, as what we'll do as well is any further consultation documents or other th reports that we feel will be interest, we'll keep populating that part of the website. Now, we're not going to, we will take email submissions, podcasts, videos. We will take them in Word. We'll take them, we have an online interface here that you can actually use. But what we would really like is that if, if institutions or clusters are having a conversation about professional development and they would like to invite the team perhaps to contribute to the conversation, we would be very keen to be invited to, as part of the consultation to really hear from institutions, from heads of departments, from heads of, uh, from staff, what, how, how this can actually develop to meet their needs. And I look forward to having loads of submissions here. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the questions, if you, and then the back of the, um, this has come up, pardon me. So, some of the questions that we're asking you to consider, and we've put the questions up, we put four kind of overarching questions. There's sub-questions you can see in the back of the, the document, but these are just the, the, the high-level ones that we've put in. What kind of professional development is needed to meet the needs of those teaching in higher education? That's the first one. What do you think? The second question, is that based on the models? Does any of them have any of them, any aspect that we think that should be incorporated into the Irish professional development framework? How can the framework integrate and recognize the, the existed accredited and unaccredited provision or existed professional work-based learning? Because we're going to have to set up a framework that does both. And what management structure would help make the professional development framework sustainable and give it ongoing credibility nationally and internationally? And I think the role of, of the institutions and, and the, the approach of institutions is going to be very important because I don't think all institutions will want to approach this in the same way. And that's why I would be encouraging everybody to have their voice, to, to share their, their ideas, to share how it actually needs to work for them so we can actually incorporate into the framework that, that's coming through. And I'll finish by, by, by using a quote that says, excellent teachers are made, not born. They become excellent through investment in their teaching abilities. Not everybody would agree with that. But I think even the best teachers benefit from reflecting and from looking at what they're doing and learning from it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Good timing.